You know, before we get into your background, we should talk, go right into the clips, I think. Okay. Um, they're very different. Something for everyone. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, but they have a similar tone to them. Mm -hmm. Can you explain um, the process that you went through with Mulholland Drive and how it maybe differed or how it was the same with the straight story? Uh, they were very different projects. They were back to back, which was interesting um, to do. Uh, and um, the straight story was uh, based on a script that I wrote with a childhood friend of mine, John Roach. And Mulholland Drive was obviously out of the, totally out of the mind of David. And um, uh, but as you say, there's a certain similarity. For example, the dear lady scene. You know, that's as written by us. Um, the only screenplay David, David didn't have anything to do with um, on all his films. Uh, but clearly, you know, the location he shot to go along with the where did they come from line and things like that is, you know, it's, it's David's um, own kind of oddball, fantastic sense of humor, <laughs> very signature sense right. of humor. And It does make you wonder when you see that where do they come from. Yeah, yeah. no, that, that's why he picked that location. So, uh, uh, and Mulholland Drive is just a unique animal. It's right, a, well, that, that yeah. the whole scene, the Club Silencio scene, has. we were mm -hmm. talking back in the deep storage area, they call it, mm -hmm. um, about uh, Mary was uh, the head editor <coughs> on episode seven of season two of Twin Peaks. And for the Twin Peaks fans in here, I think you would agree it's probably one of the most powerful episodes in the entire series. And um, there's it's, a- there's It's the a, episode where Laura Palmer's murder is revealed. And there's, uh, there's a nightclub scene happening at the mm -hmm. same time with parallel editing going on. Mm -hmm. And there's people crying and they mm -hmm. don't know why they're crying. Mm -hmm. And it has this, similar vibe mm -hmm. that this Club Silencio scene has. Mm -hmm. How do you work with um, David? How do you two work? Well, that's why I picked um, that scene. Well, that's one of the reasons why I picked that scene to show from Mulholland Drive, because also it's, it's just so staggeringly beautiful visually. And David's painterly background, mm -hmm. I think, is really um, displayed beautifully in that. And, and um, and that kind of scene, and the scene also in episode seven, uh, is a scene where there's a very strong emotional undercurrent of um, uneasiness and and heartbreak and and a variety of things. And that is just a, a plane on which we you know we could get kind of Fred and Ginger in that place, which is you know because generally editing is very logical and 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 mm -hmm. it is that too. But um, in a scene like that, you got to be able to just float. Well, it feels like a piece with, of music. Both of them feel yes. like a piece of music. And yeah. is, do you kind of work that way with, when you're working with him in <coughs> terms of kind of cutting it as though you're almost composing a song together? Well, um, you know, generally he doesn't sit in the room with me. You know, w the way we work is that um, I'll have a cut by the end of the, you know, a week or so after we wrap production. And he'll come in and look at that and we, you know, sit and used to be on a flatbed later on an Abbott and we'll go through the film, just the two of us, and write a lot of notes. Mm -hmm. And then he'd go away and I'd make the changes. So, um, uh, but in, in a scene like that, you know, he, he'll talk to me about, we don't cut to music generally, although that one we had to cut to music because it was all playback. Uh, and I, you know, I had to cut um, Rebecca Del Rio um, singing. So, um, but we, you know, just try to build a certain feeling. And, you know, so when he comes in to look at what I've done, you know, he'll talk to me in terms of, you know, I want it to, you know, them to be more emotional at this point or something like that. It's never very specific. It's all about in the context of um, it's really a interesting. feeling. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so interesting because it's, you're cutting story. You're telling a story, but yet Sorry. it's, it's yeah. more, it's, it's this emotion. Like when they mm -hmm. pull out the blue box in mm -hmm. that moment, and if you kind of look at it, Right. From a very, you know, objective point of view, you're like, well, this is nuts. I mean, this doesn't right. make any sense. But when you're in it and you're watching right. it, you're actually, oh, my God, it's a blue box. Right. And then you're well, like, what's wrong with me? You know? Right. Yeah. No, I mean, the, the emotional flow of that scene is, uh, it's really, you know, it is very powerful. And, um, and, it, and it, you know, as she's singing that song, which is, you know, she's such a phenomenal uh, performer, mm -hmm. and she sang that acapella so beautifully and it really informs the emotion that's building and the girls watching and everything but what happens at the end of that is that 
David's sound design starts to, you know, once she collapses and David starts building those creepy, dissonant, you know, undercutting the mm -hmm. lushness of her vocal, that by the time the blue box comes out, it's already built to this super creepy sound mm -hmm. thing. And so you're very controlled by the sound design without being quite aware of it. Right. Well, it goes Emotionally. Back to, it goes back to the, the episode seven that we were talking about before from Twin Peaks, where, um, for, for those of you that don't know, it's, we were talking, it's uh, where the, the Laura Palmer's killer is revealed. Um, but there's a lot of things happening at the same time, and it, the, the scene is incredibly disturbing. It's one of the most disturbing scenes I've seen on broadcast television, uh, and it's partially because of what's happening, but it's also the emotion that's being built through the way you're cutting it mm -hmm. and the sound design. What, when you guys did that, were you concerned like this won't be aired? Uh, you know, we just cut the scene, and then we show it to them, and you know, they give us, they give us notes if they have to give us notes. And I honestly, I can't remember. It, I'm sure we got some notes from them, but basically, you know, the whole scene of the dance, you know, and, and, and the violence against her, um, it was the scene. So we, you know, I don't know how we got away with it, but we got away with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's amazing. So let's talk about uh, the straight story. So how did that, uh, how did that come about? It was originally your concept and kind yes. of your you know, your baby from the beginning? So right. You, I, you know, that? I've been producing since Lost Highway, um, or earlier I produced a film called Naja before that and then Lost Highway. And <clears throat> um, I, while I was working on both those films, I saw the story in the news about this guy, Alvin Strait, real person. It's based on a true story. And uh, I was very interested in the story. It just caught my imagination I, because I'm from the Midwest and, mm -hmm. and my dad was a farmer. And uh, but the rights had already gone. Uh, he had um, raised Ark adoption the rights, and it took me four years to to kind of dog that. Mm -hmm. Ray Stark didn't really do anything with it, and then Alvin Strait died, and then I found his kids, and the option had lapsed, and so I optioned it. So I had worked on this as a producer for four years, trying to. It just wouldn't leave me alone, mm -hmm. and then I decided I wanted to write the screenplay because I, I, I you know, by that point I just was. Uh, I knew how I wanted the story to be told. And I wrote the screenplay with a childhood friend of mine, John Roach, and um, and then uh, I showed the script to David. And you know, the whole time I was developing it over four years and then writing it, he's like, "That's great, Mayor. It sounds like a really interesting project. Good luck." Mm -hmm. And then he read it, and something about the script, uh, again, it was an emotional connection for him. Really touched him. Mm -hmm. I think it was the brothers' uh, relationship, and. And so that was in June when I gave him the script, and everything happened very fast. We, are, we since Twin Peaks, um, we were financed by the French, and we showed it to them because it was a straight narrative that nobody was nervous about it, mm -hmm. and it was David. We, it was financed in a heartbeat, and we had a, like an eight million dollar budget, and we were shooting in August. It happened very fast. Well, they say that the uh, final draft of the script is in the editing room. Yeah, being the author of the script and then mm -hmm. being the editor on it. Right. Uh, was that difficult for you to be more objective or no. was it... Uh, no, no, not at all because by that point I'd already been editing 20 some years and I was so, you know, so much, I, you know, I was very hardwired by that point of making the film as as good as I could mm -hmm. in this last rewrite phase and mm -hmm. um, I was happy for the opportunity to cut stuff out that I didn't like anymore. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can you talk about uh, the, the uh, editor as storyteller, you know? Um, like, what is that, what, I mean, from an editor's point of view, you have almost more control than the screenwriter does because right. you're dealing with what was shot. Right. And that's what's going to end up on screen. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. I, I mean, working with David is, you know, it's a, a, with a director with that kind of um, vision and, you know, clarity of, and determination. Um, you know, David shoots his scripts, including Mulholland Drive. Uh, you know, it's, he really writes all that stuff out, and then he shoots it. And, but when you go from the script to the dailies, you have a completely different animal, and how it cuts together, you know, is not going to match how well it flowed as a script. Mm -hmm. And it's performances and, you know, things that are gold that you had no idea you're going to get. And so you're now working in a different narrative form, and you have to really be rigorous about performance particularly and um, um, 
uh, and that, you know, that, that tells the story so much more effectively than just words on the page, and that just it changes things. So if there are scenes that are beautifully written, but they just don't come off for whatever reason, uh, you know, and it's not a poor performance or poor cinematography or direction, some things, it's magic. Some things mm -hmm. work, some things don't. So that's the strength of editing, and, uh, and you know, is that you have the privilege of finding the gold right. and, and only using that. So yeah. how did you get uh, started? You're a Midwest gal, mm -hmm. Wisconsin, yeah. Madison. Yeah. Um, what brought you to film? Um, it, it, it's sort of circuitous. I, le I went to the University of Wisconsin in Madison. After that, I moved to New York, worked in publishing, hated that, moved to Paris. Uh, I was there for a year, and I started studying semiology of cinema in Paris, mm -hmm. and was very interested. It was fun, and so I went back to New York, and went to NYU uh, to study that mm -hmm. cinema studies, um, and got a master's. And but in the end of that program, I took their Sight and Sound 101, where you rotate. Um, you know, you're a team of four people, and you have different jobs every every day. And I fell in love with editing mm -hmm. and that process on the 16 millimeter upright moviola, and, uh, and so I just started doing that in New York. Most of these people don't even know what they I know. Is, so. <laughs> I know. Lucky you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. How has editing changed? I mean, it, just because it's, it's a little bit easier, though, but the process... Um, it's very different. I mean, very different people are attracted to editing now from the people who used to be attracted. Oh, really? Because, yeah, it's very, it was very mechanical, very mm -hmm. craft-oriented, very hands-on, um, you know, mathematical, you know, 16 frames, 24 frames, you know, mm -hmm seconds, feet, all that kind of stuff. You really processed, you know, this mm -hmm. and thinking about how that was going to feel when you cut it in and things like that. Very different. And now you're just keyboarding it. Um, so it's different. Different people are attracted to it or it's using a different part of your brain, mm -hmm. I think. Um, and uh, so I think that I, I am very happy that I've bridged the two um, methods, and I am comfortable uh, editing on um, Avid or, or Final Cut Pro, but I still think very much in terms of, of film editing, and I still like to process and digest things very slowly, and I still insist on a, you know, good old-fashioned six-month post-production, mm -hmm. you know, time frame. I don't think it, you know, I don't think it because of the facility and the you know the the, the you know nonlinear access you can get to all of your um, dailies, that shouldn't really speed the process up. You really need to it needs to gestate, and I, you need time away, and you need to look at it and screen it and have some time away from it and look at it again and go through that process. Yeah, it's I, I talk to students um, that they they feel like they have this deadline. Mm -hmm. I mean, they do a lot of times for classes and stuff like right. that, but the films that are their own kind of personal thing, they still have this kind of mental deadline. And a lot of times they don't even watch all the footage, mm -hmm. you know? It's, it's like, this is the script, this is what yeah. I wrote, I remember that take, mm -hmm. it was a good take, I'm going to use that. But sometimes the mistakes end up being magic, right? Well, I mean, we, we, for example, right? this yeah. in, the, in the beginning, that's where I wanted to go back to the beginning of the shot of the girls entering the club and, you know, and the camera's starting to push in and if you notice there's a bump, at the front of it, that, that's a take that normally an editor will never use because it's got a dolly bump in it. But it's a David picture. And when I saw that dolly bump, it gave me this really creepy feeling of like a beast, you know, sort of taking off, which then, you know, I laid in this little beasty kind of sound, which David then replaced with a much more sophisticated kind of thing. So those so are much beautiful. Much creepy, beastly sounds, Yes, right? and very, you know, very, yeah, um, un, you know, ooh. Um, but it, it's, you know, there are a lot of happy accidents. And just before that, when the girls get in the cab, there's all these things I used to use um, when the, you know, at the very beginning, the very end of a take, when you're shooting with film, you know, and the, you know, they're closing the gate and everything, and there's all these, like, flashes and, you know, weird dangling. Mm -hmm. And I was always using those stuff, cutting little yeah. abstract pieces of those in, because they were, like, obstacles I didn't have to make that right. would create a, a funny feeling. And those are still there, but... Um, you know, you really need to look at all your dailies in a completely focused environment, and you need to take copious notes because that's the last time you will have the same fresh eyes that anybody who sees the movie is going to have. Mm -hmm. And you get farther and farther away from that. So um, 
those are the kind of habits that film editors develop that I think are, you know, everybody's got shorter attention spans now and people don't focus that way. And obviously, cinematography and editing are, are you know, very different style now. You know, Mulholland Drive is very, and all the stuff I cut for David is very plodding, languorous, you know, things that people don't do too much anymore. Mm -hmm. But that's, I mean, there's such beauty in that. I mean, it's just, it, which is so interesting because this stuff is so, Beautiful and painterly. Yeah, yeah. and and mm -hmm. but at the same time, at, well, not all the time. Like straight mm -hmm. story is very, it's not mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, you know the subject matter is is it's his only G-rated film, and I heard mm -hmm. he almost fell out of his chair when he. It's fun. When he got it's the fun rate. getting that call. We don't <laughs> we weren't getting those calls from the MPA yet. <laughs> yeah, right. Wild at Heart. Uh, <laughs> you know, Mulholland Drive and Blue Velvet. Blue Velvet. Velvet yeah. Right. Yeah. Get the uh, nitrous out. Um, <laughs> so, uh, the uh, do you have any advice to the the students that are kind of. Breaking. You teach at USC? I teach yes. screenwriting at screenwriting. USC. Mm -hmm. Okay, do you have any advice to the uh, writers or even the editors um, on, you know, tips for them maybe to get in the industry? I mean, it's, it's so different now. Right. I, I keep talking to people. I, I meet a lot of people that are out in L.A. and they keep talking about wanting to leave L.A., mm -hmm. you know, and because it's kind of a different world now. You can communicate much more easily from different parts of the country. Right. And um, can you just give the students some little advice about what... Well, how I, to get in and yeah, I, I can't give you advice on how to get in. Who knows how to get in? It's <laughs> it's the you know changing very fast in the studio world, which I was never part of. I I would never be able to give advice on that because we always, we were always financed by the French, and you know we gave them a budget, we gave them a script. David had total creative control. Mm -hmm. You know they gave us the money, we made the movie, we went to Cannes. It was that kind of a life. Mm -hmm. It was a really rare experience. So I can't really, you know, I'm of zero help on <laughs> how to get in the studio system. Besides which, uh, from all my colleagues at USC who are from the studio system, it's now, you know, like four ten poles a year or what yeah. the studios are making. So it's, it's very difficult. But on the independent side, you know, uh, anybody could pick up a camera. Obviously, the sh you know the shift in, in in distribution and different platforms. That's where it's in flux and where it's hard. You can make a great film, but you got to get people to come and see it. You know, mm -hmm. and festival circuits, you know, are the best opportunity for that. Are replacing for independence um, theatrical release effectively, but nobody makes any money doing that. So. Mm -hmm. But, you know, basically, we always use an expression, you'll hear David say it a lot too, which is keep your eye on the donut, not the hole. And the donut is your work. Mm -hmm. You know, especially, um, I mean, I, I, David is an artist, and I think of myself as an artist, and that is, you know, so much fun to make a movie, mm -hmm. and particularly the editing, editing part of the process. I mean, I know it's tedious for a lot of people, but it's, it, it's so incredibly, deeply, profoundly creative mm -hmm. and you know so many possibilities and you, you just you know and you add then you add music and you know mm -hmm. it just goes on and on and you right. could just keep editing um, and you know so it's you know uh, very important to make what you want to make and take the time that's I guess the biggest piece of advice I would offer is mm -hmm. to take the time don't be impatient and you know give the footage and your actors and you know yourself if you're the director you know the 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 time you know to really look cuz there's gold there's gold in you know i mean if you shoot enough stuff you'll find gold there mm -hmm. and that's what you really got to keep going you can't just knock it out and then move on you know it it's it's something that you you know you have to go back over it and over it and leave yourself the time to do that that's funny. We, I, I told you we, I was lucky enough to have a group of students uh, to take them out to Fairfield, Iowa, to mm -hmm. meet uh, privately with David, and uh, it reminds me of one of the things he said to the students because you know they were asking him, mm -hmm. and he said you have to love this process yeah. because if you don't love the process itself, and you make a bad movie, which everybody does occasionally, yeah. you're going to fail twice. Mm -hmm. But if you actually love the process, you never fail. No. So, I mean, yeah. I think that's really, really great advice. Should we open up to questions? I thought I had the signal. There's a signal. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the mic? One mic over there, and one mic. One mic there, and one mic there. Otherwise, I could just talk really loud. Yeah, you can talk really loud. That's mm -hmm. great. I'll, I'll just... Uh, um, oh, he's got a list. You, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, um, you mentioned that you need to be rigorous about performance. Could you expound on that? Um, 
you know, when you're, when you're, you know, there's two things you have to, you know, you have to watch continuity and, 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 and you need to take that seriously. People can get sloppy about that, but just, it's, the more seamless it is, the more people will stay in the story and they won't get bumped out in unconscious ways. But more important than that, so these are the, these are the tough, you know, intersections, is the emotion that you're trying to evoke in the scene is going to come out of that performance. And you have to try different things. You think this is the best take. The editor, the director circled this as the preferred take. You put it in, but you have to try the other takes because it, it, it's, there's a magic that happens. And it's like, you know, it's like, a, it's like a chord change in music. When you cut a certain, you know, close up in, it matches perfectly just like the last one, but there's something about that performance that just like, gives you goosebumps or you know and the scene in Mulholland Drive with the girls crying you know that was that's a good example of like working really hard on those close-ups of the girls and cutting back and forth to the you know to the crescendo of the music and the close-ups of um, Rebecca you know that's like a, that's a kind of you could spend days on just that little set of shots or you should because because anytime you change one shot everything around it changes so you know and the problem I find with, you know, like cutting on Avid or Final Cut Pro is that you have too much facility to be able to change those shots and, mm -hmm. and you do it too quickly and too carelessly and you don't actually sit and look at it. I mean, editors, you know, on flatbeds, we go back and forth and back and forth and our poor assistant sitting behind us, you know, like trying to stay awake. But, you know, you really get deep, deep, I mean, and you get to know and love your actors, you know, so, I mean, you know, like the, the, like the bad, little bad angle on that one part of their mouth, you mm -hmm. know, and things like that, and you just have to love them to pieces and make them look, you know, in the case of Naomi Watts, both is incredibly beautiful and fetching as you can and horrifying, like in the masturbation scene, it's just like, okay, this girl's got to look really messed up in this scene and go to, you know, pedal to the metal on that. So does that answer your yeah, question? Yeah. Yeah. You, uh, one more follow-up. Have you ever mm -hmm. found yourself just while you're in the process of editing and presumably you're emotionally connected more than anything while you're screaming back and forth, even just for those pieces of film, have you ever found yourself just really moved in the editing room while you're working? Oh, oh yeah, all the time. I mean, that and, 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 and David too, you know, especially, it's interesting, something, you know, about the story of the straight story really moved David emotionally so that I, I you know, time and again when he'd sit behind me and we'd watch it, he just have tears streaming down his face. It was really that's you know makes you really happy as an editor. Yeah. And a story writer in that case too. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And producer. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Yes. I think we need to go to mics, right? Yeah, <laughs> the, the, yeah they're, they're pointing at me, mics. Yeah, so if, if you do you have questions, you could come to one of the mics. I think there's one there and one there. There we go. Stage left. <laughs> stage left and stage right. Uh -huh. There we go. Oh, sorry. Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay. um, hello, Mary. Uh, my name is Darlene Shani Maya. I'm a screenwriting student at Tribeca Flashpoint Academy, which is right up the road. Um, I actually had a question. I wanted your advice as a writer and as an editor. Mm -hmm. At school, I have a really good friend of mine who, over the last two years, has been putting together a documentary called Mississippi Saxophone. It goes into kind of the history and the life of some really well-known harmonica jazz players. And over the course of two years, he's gone and flown to Nashville, flown to New Orleans, and he's gotten hours and hours of not just interviews of him talking to these artists, but uh, footage of himself and his friends going to and from these places. It's kind of an autobiography biography. He brought me on as, knowing I'm a screenwriter, knowing mm -hmm. I love to tell stories, he brought me on as like a story consultant. Mm -hmm. Because um, he has, he has a friend that's producing, and we have two. We have two editors. We have a ton of footage. We have him, my friend Stephen, who knows the story, who's been obviously to every interview, knows everything, and he wants me to come on as a story consultant because mm -hmm. in his mind he needs like a narrative to all of the footage that he has. So now I'm in this awkward position where I'm coming into this really late, where the footage has already been logged. It's already been the editors know what the footage is. Steven, my friend, obviously knows the footage because he's lived it. And now I'm coming into it and they want me to look through all of it and try to come up with a narrative for it. Right. But 
I, I, I'm, I'm afraid I don't know how to approach that right. because I feel like that's not my place to try and tell his story. Right. Well, I, yeah, first of all, it's not awkward. It's a great position because you're coming in with fresh eyes. You know, what I was just saying about the first time you see the footage, mm -hmm. that's the last time it'll be fresh for you, and you're going to work on it for months. So you have a beautiful advantage in that you're going to come in, probably see a cut, right? You're going to see a cut of the film? There's that's there's no cut yet. There's they no want cut. me to, they, wow, they want they no want cut. an outline before they start cutting. <laughs> um, okay, well, I think you should um, you know, I think you should just not uh, have any ideas about what the story is supposed to be just watch the footage because another way that's uh, both in writing scripts and 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 in editing a film you really need to let the material talk to you that's another piece of advice I can offer which is action you know act action and reaction it's like you write a first draft when you read your first draft it's telling you where it's boring it's telling you where it's really working you have to listen to the work you've already done so when you look at that footage, it's going to tell you this is that char that character is really interesting. I want to see more about that character. This is really boring. How much is this going to, you know, how long is this going on? And take copious notes about all of that when you're going through it. But what will emerge to you when you look at all that footage is just that. What's interesting about it and and what's not interesting about it and what probably hopefully will emerge is why is this guy doing this? Your friend and then I would have that conversation with him. Why are you doing this? Because that will help you help him find that narrative thread because it really is, he's the filmmaker and he's shot all this stuff and he's done all this work because something has captured his imagination. So that's what you need to figure out. When, um, when that does come to pass is, will there be like an actual outline to the thing or will it be like a kind of scripted thing more in the style of narrative? You know, I don't really know much about writing documentaries. I can't really answer that. But I mean, you know, the more the most important thing to figure out is, you know, what that story is, mm -hmm. and then you know, you you should very easily be able to, you know, so that's a voyage. You know, why did he make this? What's his voyage in making this? And that's you know, your beginning point is what he set out to do, and and what he feels he accomplished in shooting all this stuff, or what he's learned from it. And so those are your beginning and end points, and the footage will tell you what what the arc should be in between those two things, I think. Okay. That's the interesting thing about documentaries, though, is that I think the editor really is mm -hmm. the writer. Mm -hmm. a, pa a paper edit is also a good way to go. You just look at all the, not that I'm, you know, Mary Sweeney, so I don't have it. <laughs> no, no, I'm not, it's a doc <laughs> it's documentary. But, uh, yeah. but, but uh, it, instead of like writing a script, you actually just take the scenes and you start, it's almost like a storyboard. And you kind of just or do a, like take uh, do, yeah, do a paper edit. You could use index cards to oh, kind okay. of plot it out. The way they used to write scripts, right? Yeah. Just put index mm -hmm. cards on a wall. For scenes, yeah. 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 All right, well, yeah, Thanks. thank you. Good luck. Mm -hmm. And the other question just left. Oh, uh, they, they want to do them all. Oh, OK, they sorry. <laughs> Should I, I'll just go. Go ahead. Um, hi, I had a question about writing, actually. Um, kind of a, like a shop talk question, almost. But um, like I've been taught in some writing classes that you can actually suggest um, a shot or a cut just based on how you format your actual script, whether it be through like white space or sentence structure. So as someone who is very seasoned with writing, directing, and editing, um, is that something that is conscious for you? And do you have a specific way you approach that? Um, you know, I, I, I was, um, as I mentioned, I, I had been editing for, you know, 25 years or something before I wrote The Straight Story, which was the first screenplay I wrote. Um, and so I then, and still, I write thinking, thinking about, editing when I write the screenplay. It was really annoying the first time I did it. It was like, cut to, cut to, cut to, and everything. Um, you, know, the, 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 you know, the mantra at USC is don't put directorial stuff in there if you're not planning to direct it yourself. Uh, if you want you know, to write something that you want a director to be attached to, that kind of thing, you should shy away from you know, camera angles or anything like that. But we, we do that mantra here, too. Yeah. yeah. So, but if you are a writer-director, uh, I would say feel free, you know, uh, to put not too much of that because the producers who are reading it will get bored with that. Mm -hmm. But um, I definitely, I definitely think in terms of how I'm going to direct something when I write it. But you know, you have to err on the side of keeping it writerly, and then you get because especially if you're going to direct it yourself, you know, you kind of want to save that stuff. You don't want anybody else to read it and take that idea. 
It's also like parentheticals when you use too many parentheticals, like sarcastically. Or yes. Actors, yeah. actors hate that. Yeah. I mean, they just, and directors hate that too. Does that answer your question? Sort of. Not yeah, completely. yeah, sort of. Yeah. Sort of. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was thinking like less the like the actual like camera shot angle. line like cut right. to, but more just like if you were to break up an action description into like maybe four or five lines on each line were to suggest like an individual shot. Right, so like, so like series of shots and you can imagine them as close up and you just list the shots. Exactly, I or do you don't that. actually explicitly state close up, but it's suggested just based on how it's structured. That's, I, yeah, I would yeah. do the latter. I suggest it by the way I break it up. And I, yeah. and I definitely, you know, I intercut scenes when I write it out. I mean, that's the way, I mean, that I think about how it's going to be edited is I'll actually go down that road by intercutting scenes and breaking it up, thinking about how I break it up as I cut the scene. Uh, and I, I definitely like to, uh, in scenes where I want to build tension, I'll actually do that sort of thing, where it's like, you know, I get more and more truncated in my sentences as I get to the peak of the action. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that, that was okay. kind of more okay, what I was good. asking. Thank <laughs> you very much. Mary, was, uh, was it a big difference between editing for television and editing for features? Uh, um, not really, because it was editing with David in okay. both cases. So David, editing with David for television is probably not, not like the average editing for television experience. Right, so he, he got like <coughs> free license to do what he wanted to do with that. Well, you know, you have the restrictions of you have this much time and then you got a commercial and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Um, but for example, that scene that we were talking about earlier, uh, we weren't holding back yeah, on right. how we were cutting that. and yeah. so. I think other people might, but yeah. Hello. Um, so my question is about how early you think you would read the script. Like, if you know you're going to be editing, you know, you know, for the straight story, you were the the writer, so you knew, you know, you were going to be the editor also. Right. But do you think that reading the script al ahead of time, af before it's shot, is going to cloud, you know, your judgment for when it is shot, make you too objective, like almost as if you had written it yourself and you can't. Right. translate your know, fix problems in post because you had been picturing it for so long as it is on the on the page. Right. Well, you know, when you're hired as an editor on a feature, mm. y they give you the script to read before you take the job. Obviously, you want to see what you're getting involved in. Mm. And, um, and that will not have any, um, you know, it won't inhibit you in any way because, as I was saying, when you get the dailies, it's a different animal. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, for example, I read the script of Mulholland Drive, you know, and I read the thing about the two old people crawling under the door, and it's like, <laughs> okay, two old people crawling in the door, and then I just wait and see what I'm going to get in dailies, which is like, you know, Christmas every day with David. Um, A really strange Christmas. Beautiful, yes, strange yes, beautifully Christmas. strange yeah. Christmas. Um, so, no, you absolutely want to read the script. Mm -hmm. And because you should, you know, if you have the privilege of, you know, uh, choosing the things you work on, you, it's great if you read a script and you admire the script and you like the story and you, you know, the more, the more you love the, the project you're working on, the better the film will be. And the editor, I think that's almost most important with the editor after the director. Um, and, um, and then I would get these dailies, which were these fantastic visualizations of the things on the page, and I would follow the script, you know, cutting it together. But the difference between the page and 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 you know how cutting a scene together is just it's just a completely different animal. But there's no reason to not know everything you can about the project before you get your dailies, because because the dailies will, sh you know, they'll talk to you. They'll tell you how to cut it. So. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, going back to what you were talking about. Um, living with the character or the you know the actors and mm -hmm. really kind of being with them i remember uh an editor that uh, cut a feature that i did uh when we had the uh rap party like uh actually that was the premiere we screened it and he was like a schoolgirl when he met the actor mm -hmm. the lead actor mm -hmm. and he was just like you know god i'm just so nice to meet you i know so much about you even yeah. though i've never met you before in my right. entire life D is that um are there any actors that you kind of you know really, really gravitate towards? I mean, because David has such a, I mean, the performances are so great, yeah. you know, from Harry Dean and, yeah. you know, all his films. Is there any particular, like, you love to cut this? 
I love to cut them all because I, you know, you 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 just live and breathe, you know, these people. Uh, I, I wouldn't say they become like your children. They become like your mother, your father, your lover, your child. The whole thing. It's just you are so focused on, you know, these people as characters, mm -hmm. and they um, and I love all of them. Well, Richard Farnsworth the, in the Straight Story yeah. that must have been just yeah. I mean, he's I loved him especially. Yeah. Yeah. He's just but I also because I produce the films, I also know. All of the actors, and and because David and I, you know, were a family, mm -hmm. and they were our friends, mm -hmm. and so I had more than your average editor. I had a lot of contact with the actors, but I I think it's a good practice for editors not to be on the set. Mm -hmm. It's more important. It's really important um, for you to see it as the spectator sees it, just in the frame, and not know, you know, like about the special tree at craft service you were eating when they were shooting that scene, right. stuff like that. Right. Hello? Hello? Oh, there we go. Uh, first of all, thank you again for coming out today. Uh, I actually walked in during the clip from Mulholland Drive, uh -huh. and it's funny because I remember about 10 years ago now uh, when I first saw it on home video in, uh, uh, at a friend's basement and just feeling, especially that Club Silencio scene, just feeling something so different about movies that I hadn't felt before. That's so there's, beautiful. It is, and uh, it felt really gratifying uh, for you to come out today and talk about that. But, thank um, you. The question I had, you had talked before about, as an editor, seeing the industry kind of change in terms of being mathematical and mm -hmm. being more phys physical in terms of labor when it comes to cutting. I'm curious from a screenwriting perspective if you've noticed anything else like that, too. I, mean, I know you talk, touched on Final Cut Pro and Avid in terms of editing, but with programs like Celtics and uh, Final Draft, just the way that they kind of mathematize screenwriting to a certain degree, I'm wondering if you have any comments right. on that. You know. As I said, Straight Story was the first screenplay I wrote, and Final Draft was already out. So that's I never had to like figure out the margins on a typewriter, <laughs> fortunately. So um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I no, it didn't. It doesn't seem as radical to me as as the change in editing, and and, and you know because it's still words on the page, and it's still understanding you know a three act structure and and what you need to do. That hasn't changed at all. Uh, which is good news for screenwriters, and I, but I think that the changes in cinematography and editing have really impacted the way films look now. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Mary. Hi. My name is Matt. Can you hear me all right? I can. Okay. I was wondering if, are there, in your opinion, are there any elements about the screenwriting process that a screenwriter should constantly remind himself of that could be beneficial to the editor once it finally gets to post? Uh, something that they can remind themselves of constantly and it's really easy to drift away from that will benefit everybody, the actors, the editor, the director, is the character, you know, the character's journey, whatever that is okay. uh, uh, in the story. If you, whatever the genre, if you make that character real to yourself, um, they ha stand a better chance of being that in the movie theater, and that is what engages people. You know, if they if they feel like they're in the world and the story of that character, then 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 they're in a dream world, and then it's working. But it's really you know I just I teach at USC I teach um, graduate students feature screenwriting, and you know that we spend the first half of every semester just working on the character and the character's journey or the arc or whatever you want to call it. And so we start with, you know, character bios, then we go to synopsis, then we go to treatment, then we go to step outline and every stage we're constantly saying, okay, so where, you know, how are they changing? How are they different from the beginning of the story? And it's very easy to stray from that, you know, deeply um, emotional point of the story. And if you could just keep in that saddle, it will be a much better film. Okay, thank you. Yeah. You know, I know you teach at USC, but you know, you from Madison, it's pretty close to DePaul, you know, uh -huh. in Chicago. <laughs> so if you feel like joining our faculty, you know. <laughs> there are the winters in oh, Chicago. Oh, please, come on, they're nothing. Did you, uh, this winter, it's this winter. It was like I know like every winter. I heard like about this, it from my way. family. Yeah, no, it's always, it's always like that. <laughs> um, can you talk about what? Uh, uh, what you're working on now? What projects you're? Um, I'm, I'm, I've written a script that I'm a spec script that I am rewriting. That's what I'm doing this summer, and then I'm, I'm developing. I'm not. I'm not sure I'm going to do it, so I won't say what it is. But I'm developing an idea for a documentary. 
Okay. I set out here in Wisconsin. Okay. Um, so one, I have another, like, <laughs> Mulholland Drive is one of my, like, I, I love Mulholland Drive, but I also have Thank this, you. you know, I love David's work, mm -hmm. and um, Lost Highway was one that I, half of that movie, I think, is one of the most, like, weird, intense <laughs> experiences I've gone through. Mm -hmm. And then the other half is like, oh my, what's happening, yeah. you know? Who um, is that guy? <laughs> yeah, right, right, yes. And, um, you know, just the videotapes arriving mm -hmm. on the doorstep, and it's just such, such an amazing story in the way it's shot and the way it's cut. Um, how much liberty does, uh, or did David give you with um, the pacing, say? Because there's the, there's the scenes in, in the house mm -hmm. where, uh, Fred Bill, Madison. Yeah, Fred mm -hmm. Madison is, is wa wa I talked to you about this on the phone, when mm -hmm. he's just walking through the house, walking right. through the shadows, mm -hmm. and an, an ordinary film, whatever you want it, that is, whatever mm -hmm. that is, uh, you would get to the point, you know, you'd get to the action, but you, you linger on things, mm -hmm. and the camera moves on certain things, and just holds, and it's just really methodical mm -hmm. and slow. Mm -hmm. How much uh, give and take, I guess, maybe? Uh, well, uh, I can really tell uh, how David wants things cut based on how he shot them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Bill is walking down that hallway and he's walking in darkness, you know, and then he's moving into light and it's like, I'm not going to cut that halfway through there. It's, mm -hmm. I just got to let it go, the length of, you know, when he starts, I have to, have to start in darkness mm -hmm. and I have to let him appear as soon as I can and then he, has, he stops. So it's, you know, it's... It's determined by the way he shoots it. David edits in camera mm -hmm. uh, that way. So, um, but I am, you know, in many ways, I just was a, you know, a good match for David because mm -hmm. my my sense of pacing, um, which you can see from my film Baraboo, is uh, in sync with you know the way he liked to do things. Mm -hmm. um, very languorous, as I said. So uh, we just were compatible on that. Mm -hmm. And you know, I always cut things very long. Uh, like the first cut of uh, Firewalk with Me was five and a half hours. Really? Because we had a ton of scenes from yeah. the, you know, from the TV characters, mm -hmm. and we just had to cut all these great scenes as like Pete and you know. Now, did with with Firewalk with Me, did it, you know, five and a half hours? Was it? Did David still have final cut in the final version of it? You know, because there's different yeah. stories that float around about, right. you know, um, was there ever a director's, like, you know, super long kind right. of fire walk with me? Um, well, first of all, the last time David didn't have Final Cut was Dune. Mm -hmm. So that's why we made films with the French, because they would never think of having any creative input, mm -hmm. casting, script, anything. You know, they were, they were happy to be in business with him. And um, so every, every film we, um, from, uh, Twin Peaks Firewalk with Me on um, was his final cut, and there aren't other versions. There's a lot of talk with Twin Peaks Firewalk with Me about um, additional scenes, releasing mm -hmm. them on DVD special release. But it was it's it would be a really big and expensive job. It would be like making a second movie because all of that was in film. We lifted so many scenes before we fine cut them, and none mm -hmm. of them were mixed. So there's been a lot of conversations about that, and the French just have never gotten to the point. The French who, who financed it and would have to pony up mm -hmm. that money uh, to do it. It's funny you say it because I just watched uh, the Blue Velvet was released on Blu-ray, and there's these deleted scenes, um, and one of them, which was in the script, I remember. The chair pull. Yeah, there's that, mm -hmm. and then the uh, the opening of the film when he's watching the attempted date rape, uh -huh. which really changes. Yeah, yeah, which changes the. Jeffrey. Yeah, big time. Lot, and yeah. without that, he's a different character. And it's it's a choice in the editing room to mm -hmm. remove that. Mm -hmm. And it's just amazing how one scene, or even one shot, mm -hmm. will totally change the yeah. story. No, it's very powerful. And what's interesting is that that is the character that gets revealed, but yes. it gets revealed very slowly as opposed to broadcast with that shot at the beginning. Right, yeah. right, right. It's a nice, creepy, yeah. creepy scene. Um, oh, uh, okay, uh, any two more questions? questions? I think I'm getting the yep. two, two. Okay, two questions. Two, two questions, two, not two, the two minutes. Two, yeah. two. Uh, hi. Um, so recently we were lucky enough to have Werner Herzog come and speak with us, which was awesome. And one thing that he talked about that kind of stuck with me was... Quit film school? <laughs> besides he that, came to USC and told him to steal the cameras. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, besides that, he had, he had this sort of idea of every scene in his films should be strong enough to where you can shoot it with one shot. Uh -huh. Without and he sort of had this idea, like no idea of what the word coverage is and that every scene should just be one fluid shot. So I was just interested from an editor's perspective, 
what you would think about something He loves like that. to mess with film students. He <laughs> yeah. loves to mess with film students. <laughs> yes, he does. Um, and sorry, faculty, I'm sorry, the like question is my opinion too. of what? Yeah, I just wanted, from an editor's perspective, yeah. how crazy that sounds. I just was just curious what you would think about No coverage? That, that idea? Mm. That sounds really crazy. And, um, uh, you know, David, David uh, was very efficient uh, in his takes, but he always, you know, master medium shots, close-ups, and but you know, efficient in that he would only shoot close-ups where he'd want me to cut in to a close-up. He wouldn't shoot obviously, wouldn't put up three cameras of you know different sizes and shoot it all. And also we were shooting film, which is super expensive. So um, uh, no coverage is a beautiful thing. <laughs> you definitely need coverage. I, I, you know, you're 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 you know tying your hands behind your back to just. If you you know shoot like the ashtray next to the chair, so you have something to cut away to, to f help you with dialogue and you know and 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 moving things around and uh, don't go crazy. But you know at the end of the setup before you break it down, definitely you know just shoot a couple of things that you can cut away to. You know especially with digital, like just shoot it. Jeez. Well, there's that famous story about uh, how Bob was created, where at the end the, of the bed. Yeah, where mm -hmm. he uh, David. Uh, heard somebody saying, you know, don't barricade yourself in the room. Right. And um, and then there was a, a shot that was a blown shot because that guy was in the mirror. He, he was our prop master. Your Bob prop master, was yeah. our prop master, and he was accidentally in that shot. We saw him behind <laughs> mm -hmm. the bed. So that's another one of those incredibly lucky accidents. Yeah, it's yeah. an accident, then it becomes the character. Yeah. I mean, it's just really... And really in, um, in Blue Velvet, there's a scene where, I think it's the scene in Ben's apartment where... Um, Here's to Ben. Here's to Ben, and he's singing with the light. And in the background, Brad Dorff is doing a dance with a snake that he yes. took out of the. So they were like walking in to shoot that, and so the de there was a dead snake on the ground, and so he picked it up and put it in the shot. So he does stuff like that all the time, but just so happens to be a dead snake <laughs> on the yeah. ground. Yeah, right. he had Brad Dorff right, right. dance with. Yes. Yeah. Uh, one more question? Cool. Yeah. Uh, Quinn Wilson, senior. Uh, thanks so much for coming in. Really appreciate your time. Um, Go Blue Demons. <laughs> go, go blue demons. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm I'm very uh, interested in hearing about uh, you know through the length of your um, editing work, your uh, just talking more about working with the director in terms of conflict and resolution, where perhaps you have an idea and I think this would really work for this, right. and the director maybe saw it a little different way, and just kind of how that whole process flows and how give and take and 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 just really those kinds right. of we disagree, but how can we ultimately agree and and find a, a middle ground. Well, you know, uh, in, in my life, you know, it, it was at the end of the day, Dave's way or the highway. And everybody who worked with him, not just his editor, his DP and his composer and everybody, it's like, this is, Dave is a visionary filmmaker. And, you know, uh, uh, we all had our opinions. But um, at the end of the day, if he disagreed, you know, he's a very, um, He's a very gentlemanly and sweet-natured person to work with for someone who makes films that are, you know, can be seem really <laughs> difficult. Um, and Mel, Mel Brooks called him uh, Jamie, Jamie, Jimmy, Jimmy Stewart, Stewart from, from Mars. Mars. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> but he is, you know, he's a very, uh, he's just a really sweet-tempered person. So, uh, but he's very, very serious about it being, you know, the way he wants it. But. Um, the relationship between a director and editor is very delicate. And the point at which the director comes into the cutting room, sees the first cut, has got to be one of the most depressing times in the whole process. Because, you know, when you go into shooting, when you're writing and you're prepping and then you're in production, it's, you know, infinite possibilities. He's like, oh, and then we could try this. And, you know, you don't, you don't even notice that you're running out of setups and days and all that kind of stuff. And then, and then you're done and that, you know, just that whole, like, you know, you put on the brakes and it's not like nobody's bringing you donuts anymore and things right. like that. Uh, and then you see this thing and it's just like so much less than your dreams, the rough cut, the first assembly. And it just, you just want to kill yourself. It's really a tough moment. And the editor has got to sit there and like not take it personally. And so, to, you know, just like, okay, let's go through this. Let's do the notes. That's one part of it, you know, at the very beginning. And then, and then they really need to know, at least in David's case, and I think this is generally true that you're not you know hobnobbing with the producers or bringing people in to show them stuff you know people are it's really private in the in the editing suite and it should stay that way and you shouldn't start showing it to other people until the director is ready to do that 
I mean, I, you know, it's, I think with any director, I would try to be very deferential because it's their movie. And you are a collaborator, absolutely. I was definitely a creative collaborator with David, but, um, you know, it's a collaboration. And David was very effective at filtering your ideas through his vision. So, you know, I, I had the liberty of cutting a lot of stuff without him in the room telling me what to do, and he liked it. So, um, uh, you know, maybe I didn't always use his selected tape because it just didn't, you know, as I was saying earlier, it didn't, when you cut it together, it doesn't work as well as this. And if it wasn't getting the emotion, the feeling he wanted, then he'd say, try other stuff. But um, in that way, you're very influential, but you really need to support the director if you're going to, you know, challenge is just not a word I would even use in that relationship or in that room. Um, and sometimes David would use, for example, the masturbation scene. You know, he did like 18 takes of poor Naomi, uh, you know, <laughs> shooting that. And I, you know, was very uncomfortable with that scene. And he, like I know, he was just like making it, you know, longer because he likes that squirm factor, you know. <laughs> and so, so he would use my discomfort, not as a censoring thing, but as a, you know, as a barometer. Uh, so I would influence him you know, in those ways as well. But, um, you know, I would just, could just flat out tell him, you know, I, I just don't think the scene worked. But we were usually, we were really often in sync. And so it wasn't, he kind of needed to hear it. He'd kind of have a feeling, and I have a sense of like, he had a feeling it wasn't working, and then at the right point, just say, you know, I'm not sure this works. You have to be very kind, because it's, so much is riding on it. And then you're very, a director is a very lonely and vulnerable position, so. But it must be just so much fun, I mean, I'm just, one, another scene from the, I know we're wrapping up, we're wrapping up, but uh, the cowboy <laughs> scene, uh, you know, the cowboy guy yeah. confronts the uh, director. Buggy. Oh my mm -hmm. God, it, yeah. just, it must have been so much fun to <laughs> yes. cut that. It's just such a weird, yeah. so well written, so well acted, yeah. so well paced scene. Yeah. Well, uh, I think we're concluding here, Mary. Thank you so much yeah. for, for coming here. And, uh,